This is the Microsoft Cloud Show, episode 189, where we're going to interview Paul Schaeflein about architecture and development in the cloud. Recorded live April 13th, 2017. ShareGate makes it easier for organizations to adopt and use the latest Microsoft productivity tools, helping millions of users be happier and more productive at work. ShareGate is trusted by over 10,000 IT admins from over 110 countries to manage, migrate, and secure their SharePoint and Office 5 environments. ShareGate is recognized as the must-have tool for day-to-day administration of on-premises, cloud, and hybrid environments. Interested in learning more? Check us out at ShareGate.com to learn how ShareGate can make you more productive. AC. Hey, CJ. What's going on? Oh, I'm finally home. <laughs> You've been away a while. Where did you go and where did you end up? Uh, it's been a very long two weeks. I, let's see, started, I guess, started about two, a little over two weeks ago, and I flew out to Seattle for the, um, for a Microsoft SharePoint developer kitchen or dev kitchen. And that's where they kind of bring, they bring people in to see where they're going and get a lot of feedback, real rough and early bits and stuff to see what stuff is coming. And we were specifically, most of it was about SharePoint framework stuff. So it's pretty cool. I was actually there with who we're going to be interviewing today. But that was the first one. I did that from, I guess, a Tuesday or Wednesday through a Saturday and then flew to Austin, Texas at, for the SP TechCon conference uh, where I was there for about, oh, I think I'm, I'm going, well, I was only supposed to be there for about four days. Ended up being there for a lot longer because I got stuck in the whole mess of uh, the Delta meltdown that happened where I tried to get home, tried to fly home on Wednesday of last week and then uh, fly back out on Saturday for a conference I was at earlier this week. And that didn't go as planned. Had multiple cancellations of flights and then finally went, got to Vegas this past weekend. Was in Vegas for a little conference called MicroConf for entrepreneurs and startups and marketing and stuff. And finally got home yesterday. And after my nice 15 day trip, I got the uh, classic Las Vegas. I'm not a smoker, but apparently I need a pack of Marlboro Reds to uh, bring it, bring me down from my nicotine high for the last week. Yeah. And the uh, You're going cold turkey. Yeah, yeah, and freezing cold <laughs> air conditioning and oh, so. Oh, I, nice. I'm finally home. I feel for you. Well, glad glad to hear you made it back. Yeah, made it back. How about you? What you been up to? Uh, quite a bit. Yeah, we've been pretty pretty smashed. Uh, we got a big release out this week for Hyperfish. We're recording this on Thursday and Tuesday. I'd sort of penciled in as an all-nighter getting this release out. Fortunately, it didn't go that long. But, um, yeah, we put out a big release on Tuesday night around some new features that we've been working on for the last couple of months. So really nice to take a deep breath after that. Everything kind of went smoothly. A couple of little wrinkles, but nothing serious. And, um, yeah, nice to take a deep breath after a couple of months of really crazy crazy work and getting this out. So um, we're really excited about it seeing the back of that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and it, getting it out into customers' hands. It's, it's Yeah, it's very satisfying to have to ship. So I'm pleased we did. Yeah, you, I know we talked a little bit earlier today about all your, uh, the experience of and how, how much of an impact it was and the rollout you guys had. It was uh, definitely, if, if I was in charge of that release, I would have definitely had the pucker factor going on Tuesday night being quite nervous about how significant of an update you guys ran. Yeah, we did. We decided to lump a lot of things in, right? We did database upgrades during it. We did all sorts of things. So normally we, we release every week uh, to production, if not more quickly. This was just a big one, right? So yeah, pucker factor increases for sure. <laughs> nice. Welcome to the cloud. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So today on the show, we are lucky enough to have a special guest, Paul Schaeflein, who has been very kind enough to uh, to join us on the show, and we're going to talk to him about architecture and development in the cloud. But uh, before we do that, we just want to break for a moment to hear from one of our fantastic sponsors. The Microsoft Cloud Show is sponsored by Valid.nl. Valid's motto is stay ahead. Its mission is to enable its customers to excel in their business through the innovative use of IT. Valid is always on the lookout for new colleagues. If you're interested in all things happening in Azure, whether in infrastructure, SQL Server, Office 365, Power BI, SharePoint, or .NET, look them up on valid.nl. All right, welcome back. So, 
Paul Schaeflein is a solution architect and developer with experience in all versions of SharePoint platform. He has more than three decades of experience in architecting, designing, and developing software solutions, and this experience covers a vast array of technologies, languages, and industries. He's a top-rated speaker, having presented at SharePoint Evolution, SharePoint Evolution's Roadshow, the SharePoint Conference, TechEd, and numerous user groups, and in recognition of his Seriously awesomeness. He's been awarded Microsoft Most Valuable Professional six times. And uh, welcome to the show, Paul Schaeflein. Well, thank you. It's a little different when you hear that read back to you. <laughs> Thanks for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a bit different with a Kiwi accent. Yeah, well, huh? I love it, though. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds more, Kiwi. Much, much better. <laughs> Sounds like I thought it was Indian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. So yeah, thanks for coming on the show. We're really uh, pleased to get you on the cloud show. And um, yeah, thanks for joining us on your afternoon. I take it where you are. Where are you, by the way? I am in Chicago, home of the Chicago Blackhawks. Excellent. Oh, very yeah. nice. First game tonight. I, um, <laughs> I believe, I believe I have a uh, a special gift that I will take a screenshot of shortly and post as part of the blog post for this uh, this podcast. That Paul very uh, nicely left for me when uh, he visited Hyperfish HQ a couple of weeks ago. So um, yeah, but again, welcome to the show. Thank you. So today we want to talk to you about cloud development and, and specifically building solutions in a cloud world. You know, the, as longtime listeners of the show will attest to, we talk a bunch about cloudy stuff, but sometimes we talk about on prem stuff. And we felt like it would be a really good opportunity to talk to somebody who's in the thick of it day to day on building and architecting solutions for the cloud, but has deep roots in building and architecting solutions for on-premises. And what better person to talk to about that than you and discuss kind of some of the ins and outs and issues and common things you see people face as they sort of transition in this world from being able to do anything on their IIS box under their desk at work to building stuff for the cloud. So, um, I guess, why don't you kick things off with telling us a little bit more about yourself and then some of the projects and things that you've been working on, you know, only as far as you can go with those, <laughs> but just to give us a sort of a sense for the kinds of issues and, and things you think people face and when they're thinking about this stuff. Yeah, certainly. So there's a couple of different ways to, to look at this. And, and obviously, with uh, the adoption of Office 365 ramping up in, in cloud in general, right, seeing so, you know, a lot of people who are moving to the cloud, but it's never a... Uh, Turn it off and then turn it on over there, right? As much as people would love to just have a, you know, go to home on we Friday on prem and complain on Monday, be in the cloud. It doesn't work that way, right? And so mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the world of hybrid is is where to go. And somewhere, so I heard someone say hybrid is the new normal, right? So while there's a lot to to be considered for end users and IT pros in that world too, but developers too, right? I can't I can't just run my code wherever I want, or even if I do, I need to understand that I might need to reach out somewhere else. So um, it certainly mm. has been an eye-opener and for some people, and, and it, you get some struggles um, in a lot of different areas as well. So I've been helping clients do that lately, both on-prem development stuff and, and obviously Office 365 uh, migrations, but then what do I do? I have all kinds of code that either runs in SharePoint, which we, we know that that story is 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 well told, but maybe I have a BCS connection to something on-prem, or maybe I have some some other system running in a manufacturing plant that I need to aggregate data from. And somehow, some way, I need to figure out a way to get this in front of my users. And my users aren't where I can control them you know, from start to finish anymore. They, they could be floating out in a browser somewhere. So I see that's a common pattern. And the way that we would solve these problems today is different than what we used to. So that's uh, I think we might have some, a story we can tell here. And obviously, you you working on a on a cloud vendor have have come across these as well. So I'm sure you're very familiar mm. with it. But again, it's just something that the guys who sit in the office all day and 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 just answer the phone, and put out the fires, may aren't maybe aren't thinking this way or, or want to know what what they should do next, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you think there are some some sort of broad categories of not really issues, but more areas that really need to be deeply thought about in the transition between on-prem and the cloud. So for example, you know, infrastructure is obviously one in terms of what this stuff's going to run on, but what are some of the other big sort of categories or overarching buckets of things people need to think about in that regard? I mean, you mentioned you know, how you get access to your data, for example. That, that seems like a fairly uh, sort of fundamental one. Are there any other kind of big broad buckets like that that you think... Uh, 
crop up when you're designing a solution like that? So anyone who knows me knows, knows what the first answer is going to be. Identity. How are you going to manage who, who's at the other end of the pipe, right? <laughs> that becomes a big issue. <laughs> and, and so all these systems need to know who the user is. And ideally, it's the same user. So that's number one. Another common one that none of the developers really like to deal with, but uh, uh, logging or exception handling, right? If something goes wrong... Well, how do I see it, right? Mm. I, I run into people all the time who who love writing to the ULS logs in SharePoint. Say, well, that's great <laughs> if you need to look at those logs. You can't get <laughs> access to those. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to work, right? And so, so what do you do that? And and there's no silver bullet that I found for for distributed logging. Although I'm, I'm hearing some nice things about some products, but there, that has to be taken care of. And, and you know, this is just the the. The, what we call the plumbing, right? The core plumbing that you've always done on prem. You need to think how is that going to scale outside of the walls of my of my or outside my firewall, and 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 mm. it's not it's not necessarily an easy thing. And then of course the um, a lot of the transition I'm running to people like me who've been around for quite a while, making sure we have a user interface that's responsive and scalable and and modern, if you will, and has framework X and framework Y and whatever. So that 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 is also another big stumbling point is trying to to get things to look good enough. Are you saying ActiveX controls are no longer a thing? Or just in general, right? Well, yeah, what have you done, right? I mean, I, I did run across an ActiveX control <laughs> oh, right, hold a couple on, I'll be weeks right back. ago. It was, uh, you know, they're running a Win32 app on the desktop talking to something, and now they need to get data out of that. So yeah, well, it doesn't look the same. So yeah, mm. it's it's a struggle. So some of the other stuff that I, I've noticed that, you know, with this theme of, of doing more kind of cloud type, type uh, architecture and development is that it, while we can do this on-prem, it's never really seemed to be the the dominating way of building applications on-prem or in the cloud. But my observation is we see a lot more people building very loosely coupled systems that it comes into the challenges like the, that you mentioned earlier about the distributed logging, the identity and all that, making sure that all of them kind of speak the same language or they all, at least with those integration points, they all know how to how to do the same kind of thing. You don't want to have like I would assume that you don't want to have like multiple points with on your uh, within your application loosely cu- coupled, but each one of them uses a different logging provider or each one of them uses a different identity provider. You want to have that kind of shared infrastructure that they all understand. I mean, you see that as a as a common like challenge for developers that are working on these kinds of systems? Yes. I mean, that's always question number 1, right? That have, are you synchronizing your identity out to the cloud somewhere? Right? Yes. And as you both know, right, that whole OAuth login dance can be hard and in some areas it's easy, right? I just set it, used the ADA library and it works for example on .net. But what if you're not writing that? That now you need to learn how that works. So that is always a struggle to make sure. And as you mentioned, the different identity providers. Just as a background on that, right? So, for example, if in SharePoint, and we saw this in SharePoint 2010 initially, right? If I log in using Windows NT, my identity provider is my domain controller. But if I log in with an external identity provider using SAML or Claims. The identity provider is not your local and anti domain, so the application thinks that's two different people. So even though it's the same person, it's looks like two different identities, and so that is a big discussion that I, I like to have early, as soon as possible, and figure out what's happening here because uh, almost every organization that is of a decent size has got these types of systems in place, and they may not have considered it to be a big deal because. I can log into my domain for this, and I can log into the browser for that. And but now, when you want them to talk to each other, that's where it gets to be a struggle. So yeah, that certainly is uh, the number one thing to look at: and make sure it's getting right. And you can't; developers can't do that on their own, right? Yeah. And in fact, I used to argue developers shouldn't be doing that, right? Who, who, who's who's better at securing your identities? You know, some guy who can sling code around, or somebody who does that for a living, right? So and it's funny you say that. I know that you and I have worked on a project together where we kind of watched where someone decided to build their own SDS, and we both were kind of like. Wait a minute! Why, why did you do this? And we, kind of, we didn't really. I don't think. I don't, no, I didn't ask it like that. I know you and I talked about it together, and then we talked to kind of a, an, another third party that was involved in it, and their answer was, uh, "I think that some people do things because they lack the understanding of how other things are done." And it's like, "Oh, so you're saying they didn't need to do it?" He's like, "Ah, oh, yeah, pretty much." <laughs> but um, you, I mean, I know one of the things that that Microsoft has to offer around that, and we've talked a little bit about it on the show, or a good bit about it on the show with Azure Active Directory. They have the uh, would you call it new? I mean, the, the business to business. The B2B capability or the B2C capability where you can leverage that for your own applications, not only just for the identity, but between different organizations. So B2B is, quote, new at G8 uh, this week, or maybe at the end of last week, right? So um, Hmm. that certainly is something and, and, and can help. 
again, the, these the, for those who don't know, the, the B2B service is designed for business to business. And the idea here is that uh, I have an Azure Active Directory and CJ has an Azure Active Directory and AC has one. But so we each log in with different different directories, right? So we're, we're probably not the same identity provider because of the different tenancies. But if I want them to access resources in my tenant, so to speak, I can I can configure my, the Azure AD to say, even though the, the identity provider is CJ's tenant, they're still allowed to come into, into my resources and I can I can get a SID, if you will, for those of you old timers, right? I get it that's in mm-hmm. my directory securing my resource, even though the person who logs in comes from somewhere else. So the, yeah, that's new. And, and the, conversely, the B2C is for business to consumer. And that's really letting people log in using their Facebook or Gmail accounts or Twitter accounts, OAuth, if you will. And then I, again, hmm. it, that gives them a unique identifier in my tenant that I can then use to make authorization decisions for in, secured resources. So those help. But, um, if I'm working on something on prem and I want to connect to Office 365, I'm not going to use either one of those two technologies. And most likely I would be synchronizing to my own directory. So those, uh, while those, those further muddy the waters, if you will, right? So it's really kind of the discussion to say, well, what are the systems are talking to each other and, and who secures them? And, and to further complicate mm-hmm. things, right? If I can have software as a service providers like Salesforce or, um, or Box or Dropbox and any of these who, who have web based services that I want to integrate with my systems. And so how do I log into those? Are they, Using the same directory mechanism, or do I need to have something that's going to broker that conversation back and forth? It really gets to be messy in a hurry. So you want to make sure it uh, it mm, works right. Mm. Sounds like the buckets that you've mentioned, right? Are infrastructure about how you're going to run the thing, identity, how you're going to authenticate with it and authorize it, and how people will get in. Connectivity to data is probably the next one, right? And that's that seems like it would be a real fundamental difference, right? Because I go build some code and run it wherever in the cloud, and it just can't connect to my SQL server or my old Oracle databases or, you know, some spreadsheet sitting in a file share somewhere or whatever it happens to be, right? Whatever the data source happens to be. So what are some of the architectural patterns that you're seeing pop up around how you solve that sort of bucket? So I'm not seeing too many patterns, plural here. We've, I've seen the industry pretty much coalesce mm. around uh, doing an OData feed of some sort either using mm. built-in libraries or rolling their own. But at the end of the day, we're putting a web service around it. And that can be mm-hmm. web API, it can be any server-side code exposing that. SQL Server has some built-in tools that'll generate an OData feed if, if you trust that. But again, this kind of, well, a couple things to keep in mind here, right? So number one, just because I put something, a web service around it, and I expose that web service through the firewall in port 443, who am I going to let access those web services, Right. Probably mm-hmm. not everybody mm-hmm. in the internet. So now how do I secure those? And then we're right back to step one, right? What's your identity provider and how are you going to secure those web services? Yeah, gotcha. And there is a, a standard now that has, has, has come out called, um, Swagger. For those long timers, we've had a WSDL, if you're a web services description language, which is the XML version. But uh, Swagger is a, a, a JSON document that describes your web services and the, the data Types or shapes, the classes, if you will, for inputs and outputs, and the methods that can be called, and their security requirements, and so on. And so, most of the cloud services, especially in the Microsoft world, either Flow or Nintex or Power Apps, can read these uh, documents, these Swagger documents, to understand your web services. And so, that's the key takeaway for many mm. people: is hey, people have been talking about service-oriented architecture for a long, long time. Right. And so now we're actually seeing how this works, because if you have a service and you can secure your service and you can describe your service, well, then other people know how to call your service, even though you may not control both ends of the of that call. So that certainly is uh, the way that we're seeing uh, that I'm seeing the industry go here. Gotcha. Yeah. So I, I know you mentioned uh, flow and, and power apps a minute ago. I want to come back to that in a minute, but I want I want to kind of revisit something else that we were talking about a minute ago. We, were, I mean, we talked about the different like shared services that we have. And we're not talking shared services like old school SharePoint shared services, but like the shared services like logging and identity and stuff. How, what about, you know, there's going to be times when an application has its own settings that it needs to share that are separate from like identity or with these other providers. And it's just something that you need to, like maybe for a tenant, needs to be able to share these across the entire organization. You know, how do you, how do you do, how do you handle like that idea, that concept of like sharing like for a service, sharing the different ser- uh, settings across all the all the the places where you've implemented that service. Again, this gets down to just data, right? And 
there's a lot of considerations there, whether it's some, if it's an on-prem service and it has a database and I can put data in there, that's great. If it's something that needs to transition across services right now, we're looking at cloud storage of some sort, which gets us right back to the same issues, right? It's yet another external service. And so I found ta- Azure Table Storage to be great or even a document DB type thing where it's, it's kind of, again, talking to long time in-house developers, they have relational databases on the brain. And that's another point of conversation. Say, you know, if all you're storing is 17 items about the current user, I don't need to put that in a table, right? Maybe I can store that somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And, and a little JSON document stored tucked away somewhere is pretty helpful. So that works. There's another, um, again, uh, in the Microsoft space, there's some a little known capability that's out now is... Um, uh, property storage in the Azure Active Directory, and I forgot the official name of it now. I, I can't believe that, but it, there, there's the ability for me to to stick some data in the directory for the current user, if you will, that, that can store like extensions. Uh, yeah, there's, yeah, there's open extensions, extensions and yeah. scheme extensions. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so so there, yeah. there's another option there if it's something that's tied to a specific user. I I can stick information with the same place where their identity comes from. That helps, right? If mm. it's something that's crossing services, again, it depends on does it need to be outside the firewall, inside the firewall? What's the best approach? And so um, we're thinking along the lines that I'm not making a ADO.net type call or I'm not making some kind of big de- collection of records back and forth. I'm doing an HTTP request. And so what does that packet, what does that payload look like and how do I make it small and, and where's a good place to put it? So Yeah, gotcha. On that previous comment you made about web services and wrapping data sources and things like that and exposing them. You see people, do you see anybody sort of short-circuiting that by doing things like site-to-site VPNs into Azure and stuff like that to kind of go, oh, I mean, what's their hesitation? I imagine the security guys like all over that, like the proverbial on a blanket, right? Like I bet he's like, no way are we sticking thing holes in our firewalls and data access to potentially sensitive product information or, or proprietary organization information on a web service exposed on the internet. Are they, is anybody trying to circumvent that or sort of short circuit it by doing things like site to site VPNs into where their code runs up in, up in Azure and, and so forth? I've seen that again, depending on, on the industry and, and, and the customer exactly right. So if I'm running an uh, infrastructure as a service, then that makes perfect sense, right? You can do a VPN from your data center to Microsoft's data center and get that stuff kind of in there. But again, it kind of depends on what the application you're running. If I need to integrate with Salesforce, mm-hmm. can I do a VPN to Salesforce? I'm not sure that's going to work, right? And even yeah. a VPN to Office 365, and I'm not so sure is 100% there. So those are all concerns. But it, what I'm finding generally is most information security departments are mostly okay with, uh, you know, HTTPS or TLS mm. connection across things and making sure that they have updated certificates. So, except for the super sensitive people, and they probably aren't moving everything to the cloud anyway. So, some of their systems are still on, you know, on their on their own yeah, network. Gotcha. So that's less of an issue. But most most of them, I think, are pretty okay with doing uh, secure calls over the internet. Hey, before we move on, let's take a brief break to chat to one of our great sponsors. While many IT teams struggle with the impact of deploying Office three sixty five. Zscaler customers are experiencing 40% or greater network performance across file download times as well as TCP and DNS connection times compared to using next-gen firewalls and UTMs to route Office 365 traffic locally to the internet. While you may know Zscaler is a leader in cloud security, they also have hundreds of customers who are processing over 1.2 petabytes of Office 365 traffic monthly through the Zscaler cloud. Visit www.zscaler.com to learn more. Okay, Paul, you, a couple minutes ago, we, talked, we touched a little bit on Flow and Power Apps. In the past, CJ and I have sat down with Laura Rogers to talk a little bit about Flow and Power Apps. You know, I know that we have, and we talked a little bit about it with uh, Ryan Duguid as well in, in a recent episode. You know, I know that we, when you're building a big application or a big system, there's inevitably you're going to have some sort of a process or like a process you want to be able to instrument that's going to have multiple inputs or maybe it's got to you know run for a little bit and wait for some additional input and then continue on. You know, in the past we've done this. I'm sure a lot of our listeners are familiar with SharePoint, and so in the past we've used SharePoint's workflow capabilities or the things that SharePoint relies on to do workflow or maybe look to an outside service. And you know, lately we've seen in the last year or so, Microsoft come out with a new service called uh, Flow, 
where it's kind of replacing, at least in my mind, it's replacing what we used to do with workflow inside of SharePoint. Have you spent much time with Flow and like so far? And if, if so, I mean, what do you, what's your impression of Microsoft Flow? It's a necessary evil. It's a terrific tool for those who don't necessarily write code like I do, right? So I, I don't use it a lot, but I have poked around with the service to see what's there. And here's where it kind of fits into this new hybrid world, if you will, right? So I had a, a customer say, well, they're dealing with external sharing in SharePoint, and that's a whole other show that we could do if you wanted to. But but they wanted to do some approvals around that, right? Well, who wants to write code to do approvals, right? I mean, I'll take your money if you want to pay me to do that. But that's really kind of a known a known commodity, right? And so... Because it's one of, again, a different way to think about things. Well, there's a service in the cloud, two of them, right, that we know of that can, that can do approvals. So why not integrate those, right? And so in this scenario where they wanted to do external sharing, it was you'd say, well, you're in SharePoint, so let's create a list and add an item to the list and we'll run a flow. Well, what the flow didn't do was talk to Azure AD in a way that we wanted. So, hey, guess what? I could write a web service to do that and describe the web service and bring it into flow. And now you have an action or an activity. I can never remember the name, but I have this action inside of flow that calls my custom code to do whatever business requirement I have, right? So it's really not much different. I, I, I can sell this to a, a power user in SharePoint the same way, saying, well, it's a workflow, and you have this new action that you just say, hey, you make a call to this thing and pass in data, and you pick the properties from the list, and it's it's just what we've always done, right? And I can talk to the developers and say, you know what? You're just writing a web service. You know, Load up a web API, deploy it to Azure, describe it with this document, and everyone everyone's happy that all works, right? So I think I'll probably change my perception of flow just because I I can see it being a great way to instrument or broker the calls between these various services. And, and right, is that what work, workflow is doing, right? And even in I, I listened to the talk with Ryan and that was with their cloud service and that was that was one of the things. Hey, yeah, I can see their their approach. I like that approach on how to how to integrate with these systems, and and I can play in that party. So why, why would I not want to do that, right? The classic developer answer, right? It's like, why would I want to use it? To, I'm sure I could build one better. <laughs> yeah, I probably could, but is it the right choice, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think one of the one of the key things there is being able to integrate with other things, right? So if if you use a tool like that. It sounds like out of the box you get some connectors to different things, but you know some of those connectors could be your own little microservices that do additional bits and pieces. Yeah, exactly. There's a microservice approach, right? It had been around for a long time, and I'm sure there's more formal ways to do that. But here's another what I call a microservice approach that that I found helpful is that um, so back in the day when SharePoint add-ins were first released, right, you, you would end up registering them in your tenant and it would be secured with a certificate. And those certificates expired in two years. And I don't know anybody who remembered that until two years and one day later when they stopped working. And so <laughs> the, yep. the patterns. I do remember a lot of people that were affected by it. <laughs> yes. Right. And so the patterns and practices group, they wrote this little tenant information portal website that you could load up and give it permission to your tenant. And it would go and inspect your directory and say, hey, here's all the, the principles that are going to expire in the next 90 days. You should probably think about those, right? So where does microservices come in? I wrote a little web job that's going to go through and just query those every day and, and make a, a call to, through the Office 365 connector framework to put a, a, open a conversation in a group or a team that says, hey, this thing's going to expire in 30 days. So mm. I can view that as a microservice. It's a little bitty piece of code that wakes up once a day, makes a call to the directory with an if statement, and makes a second call to the service, and it's done, right? And and now my administrators group can handle, right? If you like things in your inbox, you can register with a group and subscribe to the group, and you get an email. If you want to have your chat window pop up in Teams, you can certainly do that. And, and again, it's just another little way to connect all these systems together, trying to get in front of users who are busy doing whatever it is they, they do for a living, right? Yeah, gotcha. Let software do the work of the stuff that, you know, that you have to do the repetitive stuff. I mean, that makes it a lot easier than you having to remember, you know, oh, this certificate's about to expire, or this, you know, it's only got a certain timeline on it, and then our time frame on it. Let the software do the work that's really just an automated task that doesn't need to be, you know, someone doesn't need to put a little post-it note on their on their machine to say, don't forget to do this. Of course, they're on vacation, post-it note's closed in the laptop. They're going to miss it. Yeah, right, exactly. And if you think about when I'm, I'm trying to make calls across systems, you always have that uh, the, the response problem, I used to call it, right? So if I was, if I was doing 
VB or C++ or something, I, I get an exit code of zero, which was good, right? And then we, we all have all kinds of return true or return false. I remember that whole discussion way back in the day. Well, nowadays it's HTTP status, right? I, I doing some work and I make a call and if it comes back 200, I'm done. If it doesn't, I know what to do next, right? So think about, again, I'm just building on, on the shoulders of people who've gone before me and this is a, a common a common, well understood discussion or, or language, if you will, right? I, I can I can do retries if I need to because I get a status code that makes sense. And speaking of status codes, I got a status code zero from the graph the other day. <laughs> Try to make that out. <laughs> I don't even. I got HTTP status code zero. Was it the first, second, or third digit? <laughs> it's just one digit. Oh, that's not good. Just just zero. Yeah. Just by there's no way. way. There's w- no Wikipedia friends. has no entry for yeah. that. I'm looking at it right now. It's, there's no way. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. I didn't think it. Was, I didn't think it was real anyway. But anyway, sorry, sorry. To you know, you, Paul, you, you, what you were just mentioning, Tommy, that's like that's exactly what something I'm going through right now. We were joking around before the show that I'm sitting here trying with a head cold, trying to do some, figure out some complex JavaScript to basically synchronize three systems together. Uh, because I don't have access to the, to the server side of any of them. All I can do is client side. So they all load. They all have their own little widget that that pops up in the page, and I'm trying to add my extra widget that runs after them. One of them, you got to go grab some stuff and go update data in one system, but then you got to make sure that it's also updated somewhere else based on the response you get back. And then the third one is the infuriating one, which I say it's got a little event where, hey, let me know when everything is done or when you've gotten the data back so that you can go do you know the next step in the chain. But of course, it gets all the data except for one other things, uh, one of the other things, which is a getting their key. So it's let's get all the data. And then I got it tells me you have all the data, but then I go get one thing and it's like, yeah, that thing's not there yet. So I have to do like this little loop of waiting like wait till that guy gets his data. But all that stuff is just such a pain. And it's I mean, mm. it's I like this model that we're living in more with the cloud kind of hybrid. Every all the systems are disc are much more disconnected. They're not or they're are loosely connected. They're not um tightly coupled and your everything is much more asynchronous and so you're doing things with like promises or callbacks while it can be more confusing and make the, the system more complicated to build it seems to me or at least i prefer it over the old more tightly coupled one where if one of the things in the coupling broke then it was a really bad break it was hard to be resilient against it whereas today you can put the try and recatch logic in there and you can do more of you know queuing and one part fails it doesn't bring down the whole system it just kind of holds up that part of the process while everything kind of keeps going and you can get things caught up and and you know backfill kind of like my experience in delta last week where everything gets backed up and then it takes four days for them to get the planes and the pilots and the crew back in place and, and which and what you said there just reminds me back to the first question a, a, you know a common service that you have to have right do you need guaranteed delivery of messages do you need a service bus mm. Or a queue to make sure that things get processed, right? That's yet another thing we need to make sure, right? Again, while these loosely coupled send an HTTP message is great, what happens if it doesn't go through, right? Is that a big deal, right? So uh, another consideration for mm. you guys is, hey, what I need? Do I need to have guaranteed delivery? And if so. What's the best way to do that? Yeah, they do that with uh, the, all the, the webhook stuff now that, you know, we're instead of using, like in SharePoint, we had, you know, event receivers, we had remote event receivers, and we had to, you know, make sure our system was up and running and it was good. I mean, I, I like the way now where we, we have, uh, webhooks where we write something that's going to be, res- that's going to, same concept. We're still going to get a post coming to us, but really the idea of the webhook is to be, at least the way I look at them is that it's supposed to be as simple and as, as narrow or, or as, as shallow as possible, which is just grab the response, throw it on a queue, and then kick back a 200 to tell SharePoint or whoever else it was, I got the response, and then I can go through and deal with it later. Mm. To me, it feels like a safer way of doing stuff, and it allows you to kind of get things up and running a little bit quicker. I say that, yet I'm still looking at a queue that I checked this morning. It's got 215,000 items in it because I haven't built the part that processes. <laughs> it's just trapping everything. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. One more item on that. If that's new to some listeners and you understand what, what we're talking about, if you go to the uh, the SharePoint webhook documentation page, they have a reference implementation which does exactly what AC says about putting in queues and processing them. And there's some sample code in there too, so that's a great reference. If this is all new to you to say, well, what does that really mean? How do I do it? There's, a, mm. there's some examples mm. out there for you. Cool. So what do you reckon two to four kind of key things? If you're a developer today building designing or building software for on-prem, maybe it's a SharePoint solution, maybe it's not. What are sort of two, two to four kind of things that you think 
they're going to have to get skilled up on real quick when making the transition to the cloud. The things you think that you should they should focus on first. So if you're going to the cloud, you need to understand identity. And again, it, depending on your cloud host of choice, you may need you could focus on theirs. Maybe you need to know all of them. So so that mm. you need to understand as well these concepts of, of queuing or service bus. The, the, message, transaction, delivery, make sure you understand that for sure. You're going to have to understand web technologies, which is more than just HTML and JavaScript, right? So it's, it's quite... It's quite obvious that you'll you'll be doing some server side code. So, are you going to use run an IIS? Are you going to run a Node? You're going to self host using .NET Core. Whatever the case may be, there's a lot of choices there. So you need to understand what's the best way to be doing the server side component of those of that kind of not mm. not just the mm. not just the client side there as well. And then again, data storage. Right, it's not just rows and columns in a table anymore. There's many different choices, and some may be better for what you're trying to accomplish. And it's worth looking into at least what those are. So, off the top of my head, those are the first four things I'd say. Hey, start start reading up or or learning or playing around with these types of things. Nice. What are you going to throw? You have any you want to throw on that list too, CJ? I'm, I got a, I got one or two I'd like to do to throw in there as well. Oh. Go for it. Yeah. So I think another thing, I mean, I agree with everything that Paul said. I I would put those probably at the top. And if you're doing any of this style of dev, it's more often than not that you're going to be hosting some or all of your components within one of these public clouds that are available to us between Azure or Google or Amazon, or even if you're just doing um, infrastructure like uh, servers hosted at one of those public clouds or like at Rackspace or somebody like that. I think it, it would behoove developers to at least have an idea of what the different services provide so that you know what's available to you. For instance, don't go dive in and go build a lot of stuff that a lot of these, you know, they call them platform as a service, but there's a lot of these different things that are available to you that you don't have to build and have to deal with. I mean, you don't have to install your own mm-hmm. version of SQL or Oracle or Postgre or whatever you want to use for your data storage, or you don't have to go build a workflow system or have to go build a queuing system. There are tons and tons of resources, offerings that are out there. Some of them are native to these different cloud providers. Some of them are not exactly native, but they're more like they're still installable software, but they're managed by someone else for you in one of these public clouds. So look to know what's out there because a lot of the stuff you can just say, I want to leverage this instead of having to maintain my own. And maybe it, you know, it gets you going in a faster direction. You don't have to worry about, you know, scale at a certain, in a certain sense because you can throw just more resources and more money at these different things when you have to scale in a really quick time frame. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, good call. Because otherwise, if you, you end up doing things the same way you, you used to, you know, you're, uh, you're not really leveraging the fact that you've got access to all those other alternatives that might be better. Yeah, just moving your cheese. Mm, yeah. Hey, before we move on to picks, let's hear from one of our great sponsors. What if you could take any process your teams use to get work done and make it happen automatically? What if you could save countless hours and help people work better together? Nintex can make it happen. With a Nintex platform, work flows from person to person, system to system, to the cloud and back. And it flows in and out of the tools you use every day. With Nintex, work just flows, so your teams can work smarter, work faster, and be more connected than ever. All right, Paul, we're going to put you on the spot, buddy. We're going to say every show we do what we call picks, and that's usually completely unrelated random stuff for me and vaguely related stuff for AC. (laughs) That we found interesting or or useful or just 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 kind of cause. So, you know, have you got anything that you think our listeners would find interesting that you've come across recently that uh, that you thought was really cool? Yes. So, and then, since I listened to the podcast, I knew the picks were going to come up. So, ah, yeah. I see. I so, see. Um, the first one is a uh, tip I, I read from um, Sarah Ford, her blog. She's a, a longtime Microsoft technologist, and the GitHub folks have put together a, what they call visualizing Git, and it's a little basic animation thing, right? So um, if you're reading about Git and branches and commits, and they have these typical ASCII art that shows how everything works together, which is a little bit cool. I, I like ASCII art. But what does it really mean? Well, they put together this visualizing Git page 
that lets you issue Git commands. Uh, there's no repository. You just enter the Git command, and they have an animation that shows if I do Git branch, it'll create a new circle and draw an arrow to it. And if I do Git commit, it'll move to the next one. And it just kind of helps you understand what happens when you do the various things. And while Git commit... That's really cool. Yeah, it gets really cool if you pick... Uh, they have a little drop-down. You can say, uh, like, upstream changes, and it shows you two repos. And if you do a Git pull... It'll show you how it copies data from one rep to the other, repo to the other. It's really helpful to give you just a, a little visualization, an animation of what it's doing. And you can just do whatever Git command you want without worrying about screwing up your repo. So that's, uh, I find that very helpful. That's really cool. I like that. I just opened it up in my browser and I'm toying around with it and realizing I'm doing it all wrong. Paul showed this to me a little while ago uh, when we were uh, at the dev kitchen. And it's a great way to learn this stuff because no matter what graphical tool you use, to me, all the, all the Git graphical tools that I've touched so far, they still make it a little hard to understand when you're doing some of that kind of stuff like rebasing or when you're you know getting upstream changes or something. Once I prefer using the command line now, but you get no visualization with that and sometimes it's hard to be able to see that so this does this is a really good way of helping someone bridge that gap yeah and i just want to point out that there's a lot of visualizing git type blog posts that are trying they're trying to give you a, a different picture of the branch history this is not what this does <laughs> yeah. so just to just to be clear this is really let me issue a command and see what happens it's really really pretty helpful yeah that's really cool i see what about you buddy so my first one is about Visual Studio Code. Actually, both of them are going to be about Visual Studio. But there is a, uh, a link that I'll share here from realm.io. Uh, it's by a guy uh, named Alex Dima, who is on the Visual Studio Code team and has done a talk at a conference, actually a conference I'm going to be at in a couple weeks, on at the, the GoTo conference. This is from his post. He did a video of it last year at the conference. So the video is up on the blog post that I'll, I'll mention. But the, um, the title of the post is Visual Studio Code Shipping One of the Largest Microsoft JavaScript Apps. And it was posted earlier in, earlier in April and it really goes about explaining you know, how they used TypeScript to go build Visual Studio Code and how they were using JavaScript and how the challenge of what JavaScript was playing, how the code makes it a lot easier using TypeScript. So I found it to be really interesting to see a, a real uh, real world story of how this was done. Again, the blog post is from April 2017, but there's a link to a presentation that he did that's similar to what he did, but it's about a year old. So I'll make sure I put that in the, the show notes as well. Very cool. Very cool. How about you? I got a pretty cool one. It's called Sense, as in to sense something. It's a smart home monitor that you wire into your power panel, I guess. Is that the right word? Is that the, is that the US terminology? Fuse box. You know, the ter- fuse yeah. box. Is it? Yeah, gotcha. Fuse box. Yeah, cool. Where the power comes into your house, right? And basically, you do two things. You clip these little monitors around your, your incoming lines from the mains, like from outside your house. Clip on these two little adapters around, the, around those wires. And they plug into this little box. Then you plug in some, you wire the box into one of your fuses on the house side of the circuit. And this thing has Wi Fi, so it connects up to your Wi Fi and connects to the internet. And it basically watches and monitors all the usage of power going on around your house. And using a whole bunch of machine learning and AI type stuff, can start detecting what you've got in your house. So it'll know, like, it'll know the fingerprint for power usage for your toaster, for example, and we'll say, hey, the toaster's on, or hey, the toaster's off. Or, for example, be like, oh, there's a light bulb out, or this light is on, or you've left the, or somebody's opened your garage mm-hmm. door while you're out, and it can start alerting you about various things going on in your house. Obviously tells you about energy usage in your home, what's, you know, what's sucking usage, what's on and off and all that sort of stuff. So that's pretty cool, I thought. Like, kind of means that you don't need to put sensors on all of your things in your house to know what they're up to. That's very cool. Yeah, I looked, I so saw that, something, I saw that, and uh, it's, when, as a, somebody who's got a solar panels, it's always, it's been hard to tell what's using, you know, what days I'm using more power than other days, because if the, if it's overcast outside, I'm not going to get nearly as much uh, power generation from my array, and so you still can't, still can't tell where it's coming. It, it, this thing looks pretty cool. Yeah, it's kind of like reading the power fingerprints of all the things in your house. And they've obviously know the power fingerprints for a bunch of different devices. And then others, they, you know, they learn over time. But anyway, that's that sense. Awesome. Hey, so Paul, you got another one? I do. I have a non-technical one here. So it's a simple little link. And this particular one is a link to time.com that lists the most frequent hosts on Saturday Night Live. 
And I'm showing this to you because if you Ooh. scroll down to number four, there's a guy named Buck Henry. Who in the world is Buck Henry? Well, I'm looking through the pod show and Paul has been on five times. Who the heck is Paul and why has he been on the pod show five times? So I just found that to be very relevant and thought you'd appreciate that. <laughs> That's really cool. I like it. <laughs> well played. Very well played. <laughs> nice. Nice. I see. You got another one for I us? I do. Uh, this is from the Visual Studio blog from the last day or two, and it's... It's from one of the engineers on the Visual Studio team, but specifically Visual Studio for Mac. And it talks about some of the changes and stuff that they've been, uh, features that they've been adding to it for Visual Studio for Mac that was released back in, I think, November of 2016. Some of the things that they've done that are really impressive, they've got a, a part here that's highlighting all the, the uh, web editing implementations that they've done uh, to make it a little bit easier to build web applications. They've done a lot of stuff around .NET Core so that you've got a full first class IDE to do .NET Core, both .NET Core and ASP.NET Core on a Mac, uh, whereas before you really only had that in Visual Studio on Windows. We said hmm. we had it with Visual Studio Code, but again, it's just the code implement uh, side. People aren't, you don't get all the designers and all that stuff. Also support for the latest Apple and Google platforms like Mac OS, iOS, tvOS, watchOS, a lot of testing improvements, improvements for C Sharp 7, improvements for publishing straight to Azure. It's really cool. It's got a very in-depth article that kind of goes through a lot of different things that they've um, that they've been improving on Visual Studio for Mac. Gotcha. Very cool. It sounds like they're getting a bit more parity to uh, the Windows, which uh, I can see being helpful. Absolutely, yeah. And I, there, one more thing I do want to throw out there. Um, I said it's one of the engineers on the Visual Studio team. Just to be clear, I know who this guy is. Miguel de Casa is not just one of the engineers <laughs> on the Visual Studio yeah. team. Right? So before someone scrolls to the bottom and says, wait a minute, who is? You don't know who that guy is? Like, yeah, I know who Miguel is. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. Yeah, he's a bit of a legend. My last pick before we wrap up is a thing is a YouTube video called How I Made My Own How I Made My Own iPhone in China. And so this guy spent a bunch of time in China and Shenzhen and various other places and decided to try and make his own iPhone. And you, at first you think, wow, that's insane. There's no way. And then you watch how he does it and it's pretty impressive. So he basically goes to all the cell phone markets in Shenzhen and, and areas like that and goes and buys all of the parts to make an iPhone. So like the case, for example, the battery, the logic board, the camera, all this sort of stuff. And it's just mind boggling. You see these markets with just thousands of parts from all over the place. It looks like complete and utter chaos to me. But he goes and he buys all these bits and puts them together and makes his own iPhone 6S, 16 gig, boots it up. It's running iOS, the whole nine yards. It's pretty sweet. I'm going to find a link to something I watched recently from Wired, and I'll add I'll, I'll add this to your, your pick, but it's a, about a one-hour-long video on YouTube where they show the details around Shenzhen and how it's like this... Like if you had open source, open source for software and you looked at a bunch of different communities around that, that's what Shenzhen's turned into. And all those goes into detail about the cell phone mm -hmm. markets and everything. So it's a cool little big, cool little add on to, to your pick. So I'm going to piggyback off you on that one too. Nice. Nice. Hey, so Paul, thanks a lot for coming on the show and spending some time with us. It's been great chatting and uh, we really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. I uh, really had a great time. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Cheers. Did you like this episode? Please tweet about it and drop a five-star review in iTunes. Word of mouth recommendations are the most effective ways for us to grow the show. We'd really appreciate it. If you have a question for us, go to microsoftcloudshow.com slash questions, where you can submit it as text or record it as an MP3 or WAV file and provide a link so we can play your question on the show. Our theme music is brought to you by Keith Ritchie. For more information on Keith's music, head to music.kritchie.com. You can subscribe to us in iTunes and Google Play Store by searching for Microsoft Cloud Show or via RSS at microsoftcloudshow.com, where you'll also find show notes of each episode. You can also find us on Facebook searching for Microsoft Cloud Show or on Twitter at MS Cloud Show. And finally, sign up for our mailing list by heading over to our website and entering your email to interact with us, participate in upcoming interviews, and other cool stuff. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.